Good morning. As you guys stand to your feet, I'm going to read the call to worship, with, which comes from Psalm 121, a song of ascents. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore.
and take a seat. Well, good morning, Worthy Redeemer. Uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, some of us are licking our sports wounds. Others of us are celebrating playoff victories. <clears throat> um, but not to be proud or boast. All right. Uh, this is our time of prayer. My name is Brian Metz. I'm one of the pastors here. If we haven't met, please let's uh, shake hands at least before you leave. Um, uh, we come to our time in the service. Uh, we call our pastoral prayer time. And so, if you will, uh, this is a participatory, participatory time. It's not just a time uh, for you to listen. It was, it's a time for you to actually participate in the service. It's a time for you to... Uh, not just bow your head, but to bow your heart. Uh, it's a time for you to uh, lean in and pray with me. Um, the psalmist writes, Answer me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. That's our plea this morning. Let us pray. O oh, Father, as the psalmist said, hear our prayers. Uh, Father, we come to you and turn to you when we are in need. We also turn to you, Father, when we have great rejoicing to give. Lord, we give you our praises. We give you our thanksgiving this morning. We give you our uh, moments of joy that we've experienced this week as we come together as a, a body and we celebrate the goodness and grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. God, this morning as we come gathered, there's... There's hearts here who are in distress. There's hearts here who bring in burdens of the world and, and cares of this life. And so, Lord, we pray that you would comfort those who are afflicted. We pray that you would convict those who are in need of conviction. God, we pray for those hearts this morning that bring joy. I pray, Lord, that that would be contagious, that they would spread their joy. Lord, we pray that we would take uh, comfort in knowing that Jesus the, Jesus the Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, that he is not a dead God, but he has risen. He is triumphant. He is a victorious king. And so, Lord, we take solace in that, that no matter what we're going through, what it, what it, what, no matter what the world may present to us as fear or warmongering, we know that our king is on the throne and he is seated. He's not anxious. He's not wringing his hands. He is seated. He's patiently waiting for his return. Lord, we wait patiently for that return as well. God, we pray that you would give us uh, wisdom and discernment this morning, even now, that we would see Jesus in our time together. We would see Jesus in each other. We would see Jesus uh, through our worship, through song, that Jesus would be on full display when Pastor Wade comes to preach this morning. God, as he opens up, his, uh, opens up your word, I pray, Lord, that you would give him everything that he needs to not just understand and explain the text so that we can understand it, but, Lord, we pray that you would give him supernatural um, strength and endurance to preach the word of God this morning that our hearts would be soft and moldable to the word this morning. That, God, you would give us ears to hear. And, 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 and not only that, that you would give us hearts to understand and to apply the word of God to our, to our lives this day. Father, as you uh, bring Pastor Wade to preach this morning, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, fill him up with your spirit. God, thank you for him. I pray, Lord, that you would... Uh, that he would preach in the power of the Spirit this morning, and that he would bring not just words of thunder, but he would bring words um, uh, that is, is like the gentle whisper of the breeze where you speak through him. Lord, we pray again that you would hide him behind the cross, that we would see Jesus this morning. Oh God, prepare our hearts now as we come to hear your word. May we be a people who don't walk away from here unchanged, but rather may our hearts be uh, transformed and transfixed upon Jesus this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
All right, everyone, welcome back as we continue our series in Jude. Um, if, again, if it's your first time uh, visiting with us, uh, we've been in Jude for a little bit, and, uh, and we're getting close to the end. I think there's probably maybe three more sermons after this one in Jude until we're done. Uh, but the context of this letter from Jude is that uh, he found it necessary uh, to warn the church, to warn the church about uh, men who have crept in unaware um, and uh, are wolves in the midst of the church. Uh, and uh, wolves do what wolves do. They are predators and they prey on sheep. And, and, and Jude wants to warn the church of this. So we've been kind of marching through this for some time and looking at uh, what we're calling the anatomy of a wolf. Jude doesn't name names. Uh, instead, uh, he begins to lay out what the characteristics of wolves are so that we can spot them as they enter in because they hide very well. So today is Anatomy of a Wolf Part 6. I'm calling this one Unsatisfied. Unsatisfied. Uh, now, anyone who knows me knows that I love me some Hamilton, all right? There, any other Hamilton fans in the building, all right? Well, we got a couple. It's not enough for my liking, all right? I, I'm a little disappointed. Um, where's Jonathan at? Has he seen Hamilton? He just ducked away. As soon as I said his name, he ducked away out the door. I'm willing to bet, Ruth, has Jonathan seen Hamilton? No? All right. So we got, we got a couple in a row. So no, I just want you guys to know what we're dealing with here. We got Jonathan, a brother who we love, who has not seen Remember the Titans or Hamilton. Okay, okay well, we... we I'm just saying, look, y'all look out for your boys, all I'm saying, all right? Don't leave them in the dark, all right? Hamilton is my jam, all right? I, I still haven't seen it live, uh, but I have seen it on Disney+. Plus. I don't want to tell you how many times I'd be ashamed. You would be ashamed of me if you knew how many times I watched Hamilton on Disney+. Plus. And I remember when I realized that this play was different, when I was like, oh, oh, wow, this is, I I'm going to like this. And it was when Angelica Schuyler uh, introduced her sister, uh, Elizabeth, or Eliza, they call her, um, to Alexander Hamilton. And uh, uh, they end up getting married. She ends up, you know, being kind of the, 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 the matchmaker there. Uh, and then she begins to kind of sing her song from her perspective uh, about uh, how uh, uh, Ale she could tell Alexander Hamilton was very ambitious and that, that he would never be satisfied that he wouldn't be satisfied, including with, his, with her sister that she just connected him with, um, and that she picked up on that. And as soon as, it, as soon as they hit that, you know, that rewind and the stage started going and the lights were started, I was like, oh, snap. This is about to be good. All right? So, uh, but that's when I knew the Hamilton play was going to be different. And so as she began to explain and sing about how Alexander would never be satisfied, uh, this became a major theme in the play, uh, that Alexander no matter what he accomplished or acquired, would never be satisfied. He always wanted more. And this resulted in his downfall. Uh, he harmed a lot of people on the way. Uh, it resulted, this lack of contentment that he had, resulted, it played a part in his son's death. He ended up having an extramarital affair, becoming estranged from his wife. It cost him a legitimate chance at becoming the president of the United States, and it eventually led to his own death. A lack of contentment. The fact that this man, no matter what he accomplished, no matter how high he climbed, he was never satisfied. And today, Jude lets us know in verse 16 that the wolves in the church, one of the characteristics of them, one of the things that we can point to uh, that says, man, um, this is, this is kind of some, uh, a wolfy disposition here, if you will, is that wolves are unsatisfied, that they're unsatisfied, that they're miserable, and unfortunately for the sheep, misery loves company. And so let's read Jude 16 together. It says, these, so again, talking about the wolves in the church who tend to be and often, too often are, the leaders in the church, 
These are grumblers, malcontents. Following their own sinful desires, they are loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. So first, let's look at this, th- these first two words that it gives us to describe the wolves. It says that they are grumblers and that they are malcontents. This speaks to their internal disposition, grumbling, complaining. Um, in the N- NIV, it, it says that they are fault finders instead of using the word malcontent. I figured that might be a little more helpful because in general, we're not walking around using the word malcontent, all right? Uh, but they are fault finders. And, and, and the wolves are in the church And this is where we can find them. We can find one of the things we can find wolves doing is grumbling and complaining about the church, grumbling and complaining about the people of God. Uh, They're quick to find fault in everyone else. They don't look inwards at their own mess. Uh, The the log in someone else, the speck in someone else's eye is more easy for them to see than the log in their own. These are grumblers, complaining complainers, they're fault finders, and underneath all of this grumbling and complaining and finding fault is a person who is unsatisfied, is a person who is unsatisfied. This is what caused them, causes them to always have something to complain about, always have a fault to find in someone else. This person deep down inside is unsatisfied. This is a person in the context of the church who is in the church and professing faith in Jesus, but is unsatisfied with Jesus. People who profess faith in Jesus, but are unsatisfied with Jesus. And let me tell you, if you can't find satisfaction in that which is perfect and pure and good and holy, what hope do you have in finding satisfaction in anything else? If you can't find satisfaction in Jesus, no one or no thing is going to live up to uh, is going to live up to your standards. You will not be satisfied with anyone. You will not be satisfied with anything because that which is perfectly satisfying is of no interest to you. This reminds me of of, of John Piper's uh, famous quote that that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. This is the aim of Christian living. This is the goal of eternity, to be satisfied in God now and forever. Amen? This is the goal, to find our satisfaction in God. And so wolves... As the predators that they are, uh, they seek out prey. Um, They're they're not just unsatisfied with Jesus. They're not just grumbling and complaining about the people of God. But again, when when you're a predator, the way you live is you got to take something from someone else. And misery loves company. So what do the wolves feed on when they are starving for satisfaction and they're not satisfied in Jesus Uh, wolves in the church, they tend to, especially the wolves in the church who are leaders in the church, they tend to crave your satisfaction in them. That's what they tend to do. They are unsatisfied in Jesus, but they still have this sense that they need to be satisfied, that they need to find satisfaction. And so what do they do? They perform they, they, man, they've got the biggest smiles. They seem the most helpful, the easygoing. They might be the most charismatic. They might lead in the church in different ways, including preaching and teaching. But deep down under all of that, they're not satisfied with Jesus, and they think that they can get satisfaction by you being satisfied in them, by you being impressed with them. They feed on approval and applause, and it's really dangerous because, because it's not just dangerous for them, it's dangerous for you because, because, because you're supposed to find your satisfaction in Jesus. And the wolves are in the church saying, hey, you know that satisfaction, that rest, that peace, that gladness that you're supposed to find only in God? 
You can find some of that in me. I can perform well enough for you to find some of your satisfaction in me. And let's be honest, y'all, it feels good when people like you. It does. And generally speaking, I think Christians should be likable people. Uh, but to need, to need attention, to need applause, to need people's praise and adoration, and to have that influence uh, uh, how you talk and how you treat people and, and, and how anxious you feel. If that's what's going on, if, if the need for people's approval uh, uh, is affecting your behavior, and you, uh, if this stuff is affecting your contentment, there's a big problem going on in there. It's a big problem going on in there. Because we're not satisfied with Jesus, and we think that we'll be satisfied if enough people like us if enough people approve of us, if enough people pat us on the back, if we get enough attaboys, we'll think we'll have some satisfaction. This is a common pressure that many believers feel. Um, man, let me, let, me, let me bring it a little closer to home. Uh, uh, maybe even we felt some of this pressure here at Worthy Redeemer. Right? One of the things we love to do, man, is we love to get together in our small group environments that we call gospel communities, all right? Raise your hand if you're a part of a gospel community. All right, praise God, all right? All right? Uh, and, and we want to encourage that, right? It's how you, you, you get to know one another and get to obey all of the different one another commands of the New Testament. It's in the context of our gospel communities. That's what we want, for you to be discipled in that context. At the same time, man, in that first get-together, can it be a little intimidating sometimes? Getting into some, a house that you've never been in? Uh, talking to people that you, you know that you know that you're going to get along just fine, but to do that, that introductory work of getting to know one another, it can be scary, it can be intimidating, and part of what makes us anxious is we're worried about the, what the people are going to think when we get in there. What are they going to think when they really get to know me? What are the dynamics of this group and all of the different people in there? And then we end up getting in there, and, and I know we want to fight it, but, but there's a little bit of performance that goes on in those first couple meetings. You know, people's houses is cleaner than they really are. Come on now, your house ain't that clean, man. Come on now. I, I expect to see a little dust on the ceiling fan or something. You know, pe but people, people want to put on, you know. And, um, and, and, and so we see this even in getting to know each other uh, in things like gospel community. We're worried about what people think, and we want people's approval. And, we're, and, and our satisfaction is going to be attached to that. You know, maybe, you know, going into our gospel communities, we encourage you all to share each other's stories and testimonies with each other. And, 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 and maybe there's somebody who feels like, man, I don't have a cool story. I don't have a cool testimony. You're self-conscious. You think, man, maybe, maybe people won't think I'm as interesting because I've got the boringest story. Like, man, I, I got saved when I was five, and I've never gotten any scandalous stuff. And, you know what I mean? It's just boring, right? People aren't going to like me. I'm not interesting. Uh, uh, maybe... You've been in gospel community, and you're one of our seasoned saints, and you're worried that maybe you're going to have a hard time connecting with the younger folks in your group. It's like, man, what are these kids on? I don't understand these memes or these movie references. They're not going to like me. I really want these young folks to like me. It's a temptation. Uh, maybe uh, uh, you're in one of these contexts, and you feel like you're too single to connect to all the married folks. Man, I go to this group, man, and everybody in here is married. Not only are they married, because, you know, everybody in those first couple meetings, we're putting on our little show, so everybody's got perfect marriages in those first couple meetings. It's like, man, everybody seems happy and smiling. I'm over here single, right? And you're worried, man, am I going to be able to connect with these folks in my singleness? What are they going to think about me? I'm young, I'm immature. We want people to like us, and so we change our behavior. Maybe you don't have any kids, and everybody in your group got a ton of kids. All these are ways that we, we feel insecure, and we worry that people will like us. Maybe we take a little bit further, man. These, these groups, man, praise God, we prayed for a church that would grow in diversity, not just in skin tones, but in how people think, right? People come from different walks of life, different cultures, 
right? And God is the great unifier of people. So, but in that, we're going to get clashing cultures and clashing ideas sometimes. And maybe you've gone into one of our small groups and you worry like, man, maybe I'm too conservative or not conservative enough for this group. Maybe you've worried I'm, I'm a little too woke or I'm not woke enough for this group. Come on, can I be real with y'all? I've had enough conversations with y'all to know that these are real worries that you have. These are real concerns. And the, the, the fight in your heart, man, is to, man, if you want to be truly loved, you got to be truly known. And you can't be truly known putting on a show, trying to pretend to be something that you're not so that you can get people's approval and applause. That's what the wolves do. It's what the wolves do. So don't, let's not be like that. Let's be real with each other. Find satisfaction in Jesus, not in the approval, even of other good people. Even when I look at things like our marriages, I worry maybe we've idolized them to the point of we expect, we expect our spouses to ultimately satisfy us. And while our spices are good, spouses are good gifts from the Lord, still our ultimate satisfaction is in the Lord, not in the one who gave us the good gift of our spouse. Our satisfaction is to be in Jesus. And your spouse can't carry that load. I'll tell you that right now. Or maybe you're single and you lack contentment in Jesus because of your longing for marriage. The task for all of us is to find our satisfaction in Jesus. Amen? Amen. So the wolves are unsatisfied. They're grumblers. They're complainers. They're fault finders. And ultimately, they're unsatisfied and they're miserable. And they'll always have an outstretched hand inviting you into that misery. You're going to find wolves to be very welcoming. Come on. Come on in. The water's fine. Join me in my grumbling, in my complaining, and in my fault finding. Another thing about the wolves in the midst of the church, it says that they follow their own sinful desires. Y'all, when push comes to shove, wolves are going to follow their own sinful desires what they're going to do. Again, they're in the church. So they're going to say the right things. They're going to be in the right groups, all that stuff. But, but you ever wonder how you can set up like whole systems of like discipleship and accountability and all types of stuff. And people still find a way to like skirt the, the system and partake in their favorite sins. It happens all too much. No matter what you set up, when people, when, when they have their own sinful desire, when that's their chief driver, they're going to find a way around that system. They always do. It's what motivates them. And sin has crept into their hearts to the point that, that they genuinely believe that these systems, that, that God's, God's way, God's mandates, God's law, uh, uh, his perfect will is actually taking away from their satisfaction. And the satisfaction on the other side of accountability, that there's satisfaction on the other side of being discipled. This is a lie. They believe that their sin will satisfy them, but it won't. One of the things I think, <laughs> one of the reasons why I think sin uh, uh, it, is so enticing is because uh, the lies tend to be like really clear and the payoff tends to be like really immediate. It's like, yeah, man, just do this thing. Right? Do, do this sinful thing, right? And you're going to get this. You may or may not, but that's what the lie is, right? And the payoff, usually it's immediate. You can have this now. You can experience this now. You can have pleasure right now. Whatever it is, it tells you what it's going to give you, and it tells you you can have it right now. This is what sin does. As a matter of fact, speaking of, of unsatisfied, uh, the Bible positions sin, in Genesis, I want to say two or three, I think. I'm going off my notes here. But it talks about sin as almost as an entity that's unsatisfied. It says that sin, uh, that it's, 
It, it's, it says that sin is crouching at your door and its desire is for you. It talks about sin almost as an entity that's pursuing you and that will never get enough of you, that can't, that can't help but to draw you any lower and deeper into sin. Wolves are unsatisfied. With Jesus, sin is unsatisfied with its hold on you. So many of these wolves in the church, again, they show themselves as false teachers and they want your approval. This is what false teachers do. They're not really interested in teaching you what you need to know. They only want to teach you what you want to know. This is the quickest way to get applause and pats on the back and attaboys and for more people to you know, invite them to your church. Because the pastor's always going to tell you some feel-good thing. He's never going to hold you accountable. And the weird thing is, yes, <laughs> The emphasis here is on the wolf, but I also want to point out that there's a really weird, I don't know, like circle of life type of relationship that goes on between false teachers and the people who listen to them. And sadly, I think we, we pick pastors and politicians the same way. <laughs> I think we prefer smooth lies over hard truths. We know they're lying to us. We're going to vote for them anyway. <laughs> But there's a weird relationship between false teachers and the people who listen to them. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4 says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They will accumulate for themselves. So get this. It's not just that the wolves teach false things. It's that they teach false things because that's what people want. They will accumulate for themselves false teachers. It's a weird relationship between, between wolves that prey on sheep and people who don't know it, but they, they want to get preyed on. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. It's almost like the media. It's like, you, you want to know how to get them to be quiet? Stop listening to them. You want to get rid of false teachers? Stop listening to false teaching. Stop giving them your energy and resources and time. It says that these wolves in a church are loud mouth boasters and show favoritism. So this goes back into loud mouth boasting. This is all about attention getting. Look at me. Look at me. They grumble, they complain, they find fault, they cast doubt. Then they say, as, as your doubt grows in Jesus, as your lack of satisfaction in Jesus grows, find it in me. They're willing to say and do and perform in whatever way they need to to get your approval and applause. And then they can't just stop there. They got to boast about it. They're loud mouth boasters, and they show favoritism for gain. They're willing to do, they're willing to commit the sin of partiality in order to get whatever desired outcome they want. Looking at this boasting, it says here in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. If we're going to boast, if you're going to see someone boasting in the church, they should be boasting about the works of Jesus. Amen? But if you want to spot a wolf, watch them boast. Look at me. Look at me. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've built. Look at what I'm building. This reminds me of, uh, of when, when Jesus said, many will come to him on that day, saying, Lord, Lord, have I not done? What are they doing? Boasting in their works. In Jesus' name. Look at all the good stuff I've done in your name, Jesus. Jesus says, depart from me, 
you worker of lawlessness. I never knew you. I never knew you. These are wolves who do things in the name of Jesus. You might actually see like really cool looking results that looks like really good fruit being born, growing and flourishing ministry. Man, people really got saved, all types of stuff, and they did it all for their own glory. They were loudmouth boasters and did it for their own glory, and Jesus says, I don't know these people. I don't know them. They're loudmouth boasters in their selves, in their own works. And our task as Christians is to be satisfied with Jesus and in Jesus and to boast about him to others. This is like our disciple, this is like our disciple making strategy of Worthy Redeemer Church. Jesus said, if he's lifted up, he'll draw all people to himself. If I had to, like, tell you one practical thing to do, like, what does it look like to lift Jesus up? Like, hey, leave here and go boast about Jesus. Go boast about who he is, about what he's done on your behalf. If you're a believer in Jesus, you have a powerful testimony of what Christ has done on your behalf. Go and boast about it. And watch more people come. He said he'll do the drawing. Let's boast about him. So I want to close with some, something super practical here because uh, I tend to, you know, I want to think about this and, you know, in every room, you got to assume there's some believers and some unbelievers in every room. But the more I thought about, about this, I thought, man, really the charge is the same. If you're in this room and you're a believer or you're an unbeliever, uh, uh, I'm asking you to do the same thing today. And that is to find your satisfaction in Jesus. Find your satisfaction in Jesus. If you don't believe in Jesus, man, repent of your sin. Turn to Jesus and find your satisfaction in Jesus. If you've already believed in Jesus, resist the temptation to find your satisfaction in something else other than Jesus. And keep pressing in and finding your satisfaction in Jesus. Because if you're not satisfied with him, you won't be satisfied with anything or anyone else. Everything will let you down. Everything. It says in John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He's talking about our satisfaction, y'all. He says, I'm the bread of life. And get this, uh, man, he says, I'm the bread and I'm the water. I can't help but think that, like, these are, like, the most basic things for survival. Like, the most basic. Like, when I imagine, like, somebody in jail, like, in the hole, and they just get limited food and stuff, I just think they probably get some bread and some water. That's it. Like, this is, this is your most basic. You need this to just not die. I think there's something to that by Jesus saying, I'm the bread of life. And if you believe in me, you'll never thirst. I think it's saying that we need Jesus on the most basic level. Like we're talking about being satisfied. We can't be satisfied with, in the most basic things without Jesus, without the bread of life, without the living water. Even at our most base level, we need Jesus to satisfy us. Bread and water ain't fancy. He could have been like, I'm the steak and the potatoes. I'd have been like, ooh. <laughs> At the most basic level, bread, water, find your satisfaction in me. This, this reminds me of a story I'll share with you about uh, when I went to India. I'll close with this. I was in India, and I had a translator there. And, um, and my translator had converted to Christianity. And him and I spent, I can't remember, it was just under two weeks, hanging out every day, talking. And we'd go into these remote parts, 
these villages, and we would talk to people about Jesus, and he would translate for me, and it was awesome. I got to know him really well. I started asking him one day. I said, hey, man, when did you become a Christian, and how? And he started talk to me, talking to me about growing up and being raised in Hinduism. And um, he said, the older I got, the more I had a problem with the idea of having all these gods. And I was like, explain it to me. Break it down. He said, well, he said, you know, he's like, you have a god, but then you still are lacking. Like, there's still something missing. And so then you have to go get another god for the thing that you're missing. It's like, oh, man, I, 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 need, I need a god to, like, help me prosper financially. And so you worship that deity. And it's like, okay, we're having a hard time having children. So you get another deity, and you, and you add that, and you worship that deity. And you just take that and extrapolate that throughout all your whole life. And you keep adding God after God after God to try to step in and to fill a gap. And he said at some point in time he realized, he was like, I'm not satisfied, I wasn't satisfied with all the gods. Like no matter how many gods I added to my life, I still had a lack. I still had a hole. I was still unsatisfied. I just had to keep adding more and more, and it became a burden for me to be obligated to all of these different deities. He said, and then I heard about Jesus. He said, and then I heard about Jesus, a God who, who, who put on flesh and entered into the human experience and, and, and lived a perfect life and made a sacrifice for me. You've never heard of that before. A God who makes a sacrifice for the people? It blew him away. And he was so moved by the gospel that he renounced all of his other gods and he grabbed a hold of Jesus and he said, Jesus is enough. He said, Jesus is enough. He said, when I got Jesus, I was satisfied. And it speaks to the surpassing worth of Jesus because it's not that Jesus is better than one of the other gods. It's that Jesus is better than all of the other gods combined. It's like if you combined all of their promises, everything that he sought after them for, and, com- and added everything up that every one of those deities had to offer, he still had lack until Jesus. It was then that he found peace in the perfect work of Jesus. And so this is the charge for the church, um, is that we do the same thing. We might not call them deities or gods, but we place our satisfaction in things outside of him. Uh, if you are trying to find ultimate satisfaction in your children, man, take back that and man, give it to the Lord. Your children will not ultimately satisfy you. It's not their job. If you're doing the same thing to your spouse, your spouse will not ultimately satisfy you. It's not their job to perform for you on a daily basis and to make sure that you're satisfied in your soul. I think God uses our spouses and our friends and our children. He uses these things to add value and to point us to him. But that's not where, that's not where the, our hearts should be fixed. Anything, if you're finding fulfillment Or value, if you think, man, if I can just climb the corporate ladder a little bit more, I I will be more satisfied in my life. If I can just get that validation from my work, if I can just get that promotion, if I can just get that pay, I will be satisfied. No, you won't. No, you won't. There's a reason why multi-billionaires still get up and work every day. Not satisfied. There's a reason why every year you look at people Uh, celebrities who seem like they have the world in the palm of their hand committing suicide. Unsatisfied. To work hard, I'm telling you, it's a steep cliff to drop off of. To work hard, to gain, and and to acquire, and to get status and money or whatever else you thought would satisfy you, only to get everything you thought would satisfy you and still be unsatisfied. This leads people to ruin.
People lose their lives and their souls over this stuff. So this is the ask, church. Every Christian here is that you would find your satisfaction in Jesus. And if you're here and you're not a believer, I'm telling you, I know right now, I don't have to know you to know that you are not satisfied in your life. You are not satisfied. It's, why you're, it's probably one of the reasons why you're here. If you're an unbeliever and you're here today, if you were perfectly satisfied, I don't know if you'd be here today. I want to invite you to be satisfied with the only one, in the only one who can truly satisfy and the bread of life and the living water, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let me close in prayer, and then we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. Heavenly Father, help us to be satisfied in you. Help us to be satisfied in the work of your son. God, there's so many things that are vying for our attention. Everything's pulling us in a lot of different directions. And all of these things are promising to satisfy us. Some of the things are even good things. Some of the people are good people. But there's a false promise. There's a there's an expectation that these things, that these people, these accomplishments, these acquisitions will satisfy us, but they won't. So God, on a practical level for our church, um, I pray that you would um, shine a light on all of our own hearts individually. That even though we, we may not ourselves be a wolf, it still doesn't mean that we can't struggle with with sin in this way, that we still can't be grumblers and complainers or, or fault finders. Anybody can struggle with that. And so, God, as you reveal to us that this is not your will for us, that this is not pleasing to you, that we would operate in that way. Uh, God, please help us to not be like the wolves. Please help us uh, to be satisfied. Please help us to identify the things in our lives that are taking away our satisfaction, that are stealing our joy. And that we would refocus our attention on your word and on your son. So God, I pray that you grow us in love. I pray that you grow us in joy. I pray for our gospel communities as we lean into one another in that context, uh, that, that people would be true with one another. that people would feel welcomed, comfortable enough to say, I don't have to perform here. And that if there's anything in our hearts that causes us to, to, to want to, to be fake or to perform or try to get the approval of, of other people, God, I just pray that you would deal with that in our hearts, that you would humble us. And that you would reassure us that, that, God, our value is in whose we are and we belong to you. So, God, I pray for our uh, time of communion. Would you please prepare our hearts and minds to be reminded of the good news of the gospel as we take the bread and we take the cup. May you use it as another way, another display um, that your desire is for us to be satisfied in you, that we would take the bread and that would be satisfied and that we would take the cup and that we'd be satisfied and that we would look to your body broken and your blood shed and see that God's wrath has been satisfied. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.
When I'm worried about tomorrow, I won't be overwhelmed. The burdens that I've carried, I will choose to lay them down. What I've learned about your favor, your mercy and your grace, as they go on. In the joy and in the sorrow, I find you just the same. Behind my darkest mornings, there's a peace I can't explain. I'm so grateful for your favor, your mercy and your grace, cause they go on. Drenched in tears, 
you together. Praise God from home, all blessings from. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heaven. joy getting to sing with you this morning. Uh, before we go, I'm going to read our parting scripture, and if you'll read it with me, it comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, 
that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Amen. You are dismissed.